gonna start you guys off with a hypothetical scenario. Uh, you're gathered with some buddies and you guys are watching football game and it's your favorite team, you're playing your rival, you really wanna win this game. And your team has the ball, you're driving, you're down by four at the end of the game, so you need a touchdown. You get down inside the 10 yard line, offense sputters a little bit, and eventually you have fourth down and goal at about the six yard line with about a minute 15 to go. Gotta get a touchdown. You're sitting there with your buddies, you're like, man, I hope they get this one in. And then you're watching and they run the speed option, which is already a horrible and outdated play for many, many years, just a terrible decision. And of course, they don't get in and you're just distraught. Well, the sad part about it is that this isn't actually hypothetical. This is a real life situation for many fans. No! There we go. And, oh, bummer, Kentucky football loses again. So, the first thing here that you ask yourselves when you're sitting there with your buddy is, oh my gosh, why am I a Kentucky fan? And frankly, this is a question that should have been asked a long time ago. And if you're just figuring this out now, you've got other issues. But the second question you're probably asking yourself is, why is there somebody coaching at the collegiate level who's calling that play in that situation? Well, this is a question that I ask myself all the time. What are they doing? Why is a coach doing that? And so that's what I set out to figure out this year. So for my capstone, uh, I looked at coaching, uh, particularly at the higher levels, and then how can you relate that back to Christianity? Um, so my story with sports and with coaching, when I was little, uh, my dad has always coached, and so I've always been around him. Uh, when I was five, six years old, I'd go to practices, listen to him talk, and it was just like, I got to absorb the strategy of sports, how to communicate that to younger kids. Um, so I was always around it. Uh, when, we were, when I was really little, I had a little, a little suit and a tie, and I'd sit on the bench with my dad at his games, and it was great. Um, because of this, I got, I got really well equipped with knowledge about sports strategy and things like that. And so when, we, when I was younger, uh, every year from preschool through seventh grade, I got recess football taken away at my school because I would yell at the other kids so much that they would cry and they didn't want to play. And I didn't mean to be a jerk. I just wanted to win and I could see things that, that they couldn't see. I could see, right, if you've got your guy beat to the inside, you should run a post or whatever. And these things drove me nuts. And it happened every year and I got in trouble and it was a whole big fiasco. So I knew when I was younger, right, when every kid when they're younger thinks I'm gonna go play in the NFL. And then one day I woke up and realized I'm 5'11 and white and I wasn't gonna play in the NFL. And so um, I, I had to realize that just wasn't in the, in the cards for me. But I loved the strategy of sports and things like that. And so as I got older, I realized, wow, coaching might be perfect for me because it lets me continue to be around sports, which has given me so much in my life. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. Um, and if I was able to coach, then I could still be around that even though I wouldn't be able to play. Uh, so when, when we started doing Capstone, I had to figure out how to relate this back to Christianity. And so looking at the relational side of coaching, I've always loved the X's and O's side, but looking at the relational side of coaching, how do you relate with your players? How do you positively impact your players um, through your and be able to show your faith through coaching. Um, I think, especially at higher levels, uh, a lot of those guys don't have a great Christian influence in their in their lives. They don't have that positive Christian voice. And so, if you're able to coach really well and move up the ladder, and people will get to hear your story, then you can impact your athletes, which I think is super super valuable for the kingdom. Um, I. My, my capstone experience was kind of twofold. I started in the, in the fall really diving into the schematics and the X's and O's of coaching. Um, right, when Mr. Spector said, what do you love? It's sports, but it's the strategy of sports. And I didn't really care about the relational aspect as much. Uh, so in the first semester, I got to interview Blaine Mueller. Uh, he's one of Mr. Static's friends. And he coaches for the Milwaukee Bucks. And it was, the coolest interview I've ever done in my life. Uh, we talked for like three hours. I think I asked one question. And it was just like every, like we just kept talking and it was, it was fantastic. It was like I was talking to myself in the future. Um, he is so knowledgeable, 
so smart and it was like, yeah, anything I wanted to ask him about coaching or about sports, he could answer. It was awesome. Uh, so I had this great experience with him. It was great to hear from someone who's done what I want to do because he was able to explain logically how you're going to move up the coaching ladder, right? Starting as a graduate assistant, things like that. And he was able to explain all the stuff that I would have never been able to figure out. So I got to learn from him a lot about the schemes and stuff that they run in the NBA and then how, how do you actually become a coach? It was a really cool experience. At the December point, we do the little nine minute speech and I really was struggling to come up with what I wanted to do for the relational aspect. And Schultz told me that, he said, you have to come up with something. I just didn't really know what to do. And then our basketball season started and I got to play for Coach Stidham, Coach Peacock, Coach Matthews. And it just reminded me why it's so important for a coach to be relational and to build relationships with your players. Man, how much fun basketball was just because we were hanging out with those guys and what great coaches they were that yeah, they all know the game really, really well. They were able to invest in us and we did fun things outside of basketball and it reminded me why it's so important to have a relational coach. So as part of that, um, I went and talked to Coach Stidham for my spring interview. And again, I right, he knows 100 times more about basketball than I ever will. So I was able to ask him some strategy questions and things like that, that captivate my mind. But then we were able to talk a lot about what it looks like to be a relational coach, why that's important, why it's so critical for you to have those relationships with your players because your players are gonna play harder for you and are gonna be able to do more for you. Um, so it was a really, really cool experience. Um, we, sorry guys. Uh, so it was, it was cool for me, especially because I was in the middle of playing for him and realizing why it was so important to have a relational coach. Uh, one of the like most fascinating things to me was I asked I asked the same question to Blaine Mueller coaching the NBA and Coach Stidham coaching at the high school level. I said, what's the most important characteristic in a coach? And they both said being able to relate to your players. Um, that's really cool to see two guys at completely different levels of coaching and say, this is actually really important to being a coach and relating to your players is so crucial. So that was really, really cool. Uh, one of my one of my favorite things that I picked up from, from Coach Mueller was that I asked him, you know, when you're in the NBA, right, you guys play on Christmas Day, you do all these things. I said, how do you, how do you balance that with having a family and whatever? And he gave me this really cool quote that I wrote down here, and I, I think it's awesome. He said, I'd rather be happy 364 days of the year and unhappy one day of the year than the other way around. Be happy that I got to see my family one day a year and be in a job that I hate the rest of the year. That was really cool for me that it just like solidified in my mind. Like, I know I want to coach. I know I love this. I need to keep pursuing it because, right, he, he's exactly right that um, the, the, the bulk of your year is more important. Um, and that's, that would be really cool. So I took this, all this information I had and, and put it into my capstone process, my rough draft here at the end of the year and thought, okay, well, how do I take all this stuff about relational coaching um, and, and apply it to right, the capstone part, you know, the assignments, all that stuff. And one of the questions that I kept coming back to was if you want to coach, you have to ask yourself, why do you want to coach? And if part of your answer is not for the players, then there's something wrong. You can love the sport and you can love, I mean, I, I love football, but if your answer is not also that you love the guys you're coaching and that you want to impact them and, and impact their lives positively, then there's something wrong with it and impacting their lives positively for Christ and being able to show your faith to guys that don't, that don't necessarily get that. That's a really cool experience. Uh, so now some of you will hate this. Some of you will love it. I play quarterback. And I love the strategy of football and it is the greatest thing in the whole world. And so um, I love watching film, breaking down film, things like that. And so one of the things that's so enticing to me about coaching is there's nothing better than going into a game and have, and being able to out strategize your opponent because you were more prepared than them. And so part of doing that is through film study. So we're going to watch film. It's going to be great. Uh, this is, oh, you can do it. There you go, buddy. Okay. So obviously we're going to watch the goat because he's the greatest to ever do it and no one will ever compare to him. Um, 
having a great quarterback is just like having a great coach, right? A lot of times these quarterbacks, you'll hear the expression, they're a coach on the field. Um, so a lot of the things here that Big Ben does on this play are what a good coach can instill in a quarterback. So I love this kind of thing. This game I watched with CJ and Sydney at Grace's house. And before this play, it was third and 10. I told CJ he's going to hit Juju over the middle for a first down, which is exactly what happened. So first off, oh, we're going to go a little farther. There we go. Okay. So understanding the strategy of sports. Some of you are going to be really bored. Some of you are going to love it. I'm really sorry. I don't know how to use this uh, clicker thing very well. So, oh, you can't even see it. Well, that's a bummer. All right. Well, swing and a miss. Okay. So up here, they've put a tight end at the top of the screen. And why this is important is your tight ends are usually bigger guys. This is Eric Ebron. He's 6'5", 245 pounds. So he's too big for a cornerback. Those are your little scrawny dudes out here who usually cover the wide receivers. He's too big for a corner to cover. So what you know as a quarterback and or as a good coach is that when Dallas puts a linebacker outside here, that's Jalen Smith. He's built very similar. He's 6'3", 250. When they put a linebacker outside, you know that it's man-to-man -man because you would never leave a corner outside if you were going to play zone coverage. So by putting by putting it like an unorthodox formation in here by moving a tight end out, he's able to figure out beforehand what defense they're in. This is something that if you watch the Super Bowl, the Chiefs really struggled to move the ball. And I heard all week after this about how, well, the Kansas City offensive line was so bad and blah, 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 which is true. But there was something lacking, right? And it, Patrick Mahomes is three years in the league, so he'll get to this point. He's not there. But as a quarterback, you need to be able to make a pre-snap read and know where you're going with the ball. And that's something that a good coach will teach him, right? Andy Reid will install that in him at some, instill that in him at some point. Um, but you need to be able to make a good pre-snap read. So by moving the tight end out here, Ben is able to figure out that it's man-to-man -man coverage. Then you have two safeties to the top of the screen. So this tells him that it's either cover two or cover one robber. You have man-to-man -man underneath and you have two safeties back. Cover one robber would mean that the safeties basically stack on each other and they're covering the middle of the field, short and deep. Cover two is they're both gonna have a deep half of the field. So what Ben does is he takes both of these receivers here and has them literally just turn and do a bubble screen. And the idea of that is that they're gonna pull their corner up to create all of this space out here in the zone that the safety has to occupy. From there, they're gonna run an out with Deontay Johnson and a corner with Chase Claypool. They're gonna run a seam right up the middle to Juju and that's where the ball goes. And why this is really interesting to me is that if you have watched enough film and, and you're as prepared as Ben is in this situation, it becomes almost like a no-brainer where he's going with the football. This play I saw the week after on social media everywhere because when Claypool cuts, he's pretty open. And people are like, oh, he could have thrown it to Claypool for a touchdown. And when you understand the strategy of sports and you watch enough film, they can run this play a thousand times and Ben is never even looking at Claypool because he knows that the ball's gonna go over the middle because that's the area of the zone defense when he sees the safety split, he knows that that's where the weakness of the coverage is. So, at some point, there it is. There's it right over the middle, they get it easy first. So, I think outside of being able to relate with your players, film study is one of the most important parts of being a coach. You have to know what your opponent wants to run. You have to be able to out-strategize them. Uh, this is shown, right? Bill Belichick, maybe the greatest coach ever. Tom Brady, definitely the greatest quarterback ever. A couple of years ago, when they played Kansas City in the AFC Championship game, the Chiefs and the Patriots went to overtime. New England got the ball first and went down and scored, and they go to the Super Bowl. And people go, wow, you know, you can't give Tom Brady the football, and it's so true. But the reason that that happens is because the Patriots, Belichick, great coach, Brady, great quarterback, had scouted Kansas City enough to say they knew that every time there was a third and long on that drive, they were going to run cover one robber. And there were three times where New England had third and eight or longer. On all three, they ran cover, or Kansas City ran cover one robber, and New England moved it right down the field, and they go to the Super Bowl. So being able to out-prepare and be out-strategize your opponent because you were more prepared in the film room is crucial to coaching, and it's something I think 
I would be pretty good at. I love watching film, as you can see. This stuff fascinates me. So uh, I think it's something that I would be suited for down the road. Fun. Uh, the last thing that was really cool for me was as this, as this semester winded down, I read the book 3D Coaching, which talks a lot about relational coaching. Um, and it was, again, it was just great for me hearing Stidham's voice tell me about how to relationally coach, then reading this book. And it was just like all these things that were helping me with something that I didn't really want to research because I thought it's not fun to research relational coaching. It's fun to research schemes and stuff like that. So, but it was really great. And in the, in the book, at the end of the book, there's this story about Bobby Bowden, who coached at Florida State. He's an amazing football coach. And Bobby Bowden had a former player that got arrested about eight years after he had played at Florida State. And the guy went to trial and Bobby Bowden flew down and went into the courtroom and testified on behalf of this player. And eventually the judge let him go and whatever. But that right there is like the pinnacle of relational coaching because it's not even like this kid was a, a current player that was gonna impact the way they played. It wasn't like he was a recruit and they were gonna, it was gonna impact how well they played next year. Whether or not this kid went to jail or not did not affect Florida State football in any way, shape, or form. But because Bobby Bowden had built that relationship with his player, he felt it was necessary to fly down there and take time out of his, out of his schedule to go and uh, testify on behalf of this player. That's really, really cool. And it was a story that, as I was reading, I thought that's something I would want to do one day for a player. That's just a really cool story. Um, so, sports have, thanks, baby. Sports, always been my passion. Um, I, like I said earlier, nothing in the world gets me more motivated than sports. As most of you know, I don't really care that much about school. But if it's a sports thing, I'll spend eight hours on it. Like, I love that. And there's no, there's just nothing I'd do, rather do than that. I, I have so much fun with that. So at some point, I don't know when it is, but at some point, my days of playing sports are going to be over. But I'm really, really excited that I get to continue being around the atmosphere, the strategy, the preparation of sports through the world of coaching.